what if I just say that these characters aren't necessarily representing? And if a reader decides that they represent, that's the reader's choice, but it's not necessarily a burden that I have to feel as an author. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. We make e-readers and apps and we sell e-books and audiobooks all over the world. And we do it because we love reading and we want to make reading lives better. One of the best parts of the work that we do is that we get to talk with authors about their books as well as the books that shape them as writers and as readers. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is Tori Peters, author of the novel Detransition Baby. It is the story of Reese, a trans woman who wants more than anything to be a mother. When Reese's ex, Amy, who now goes by Ames, impregnates Katrina, his boss, Reese sees an opportunity to fulfill her maternal dream, but it requires a creative family configuration. It will come as no surprise to anyone who's read it that this book was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. The book is irreverent and soapy and sexy and provocative and just a fantastic read. Tori Peters, welcome to Kobo. I'm so thrilled to be here and so thrilled that I get to talk to you. This is a podcast about reading and writing live. So let's begin at the very beginning. Describe young Tori Peters to me as a kid and, and what your relation to books were then. Um, I always I always read. My parents, um, my dad was a professor and he had a, uh, he had this, this way of like incentivizing me to read, which is that anytime I was like, usually once a week we passed a bookstore, he would take me in and get me a book. And it was just, it was a way that, that he made me love books. Cause it was like a treat. I, I didn't yeah. get a lot of other things, but he was like, this is, this is something you, you don't, I don't say no to books. And uh, it, it made me it made me like a lifelong reader, I think, that that habit. But as a result, I just kind of picked, when I was young, I just picked things oftentimes based on what the cover looked like, what what intrigued me. And uh, it didn't really become like, I didn't really learn what I loved in reading until I was maybe in my teens or a bit older. And what was the first book that you remember really grabbing you? Like the one, the one that just got its hooks in? There's a book called The Phantom Tollbooth, and I can't even tell you yes. who the author was, but that book, it it played with language, like the words meant different things. And I, I remember being a kid and being like, oh, like, I've noticed that words mean different things, but adults don't seem to find that fun. And here's like a book that actually is like making games out of that. And uh, I read it, I don't know, I, I must have read it 20 times. You said that you you then kind of your reading habits started to change as you got into your teen years. So what became the books that uh, that you were reading then? Um, I started like you know I, I think I had when I was younger I'd read a lot of genre, a lot of sci-fi and things like that. And then when I was like sixteen, I think I met some friends who were like, no, you have to like read, you have to read the books that are important. And so I read, and I didn't really know what was actually important i think that it was just like um you know they would give me books like i remember there was a book about fly fishing um a river runs through it you know they they're like this is an important book why that book was important i don't know but it was like it was this idea <laughs> that you should read uh like literary it was teenage books. important yeah it was like very important to fly fish um and then and then when i when i was 18 I lived in the Dominican Republic and, and books in English were pretty hard to get. Um, but there was that uh, modern library list of like a hundred best books or whatever that, that came out at um, around 2000. It was like a hundred best books of the century. The, and uh, my mom started just sending me books off of that list. So that's where I you know was introduced to things like hundred years of solitude or, um, Hemingway and just you know a lot of like the sort of uh, beloved I think was number one on that list Toni Morrison so I started actually reading for for um you know sort of systematically down that list for an entire year um just because it was the only things that were available and then in English and then by the time I got to college I, I picked my first course in literature 
completely on a misunderstanding. It was uh, American liter literary modernism. And I didn't understand that modernism was like a separate thing. I thought it was just like not old books. I was like, it's modern. Right. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to read old books. I want to read modern books. And then, and then, you know, when I took the class, I learned like, oh, this is like a, this is like a thing that has to do with like approach and language. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it definitely forms me as a, as a reader to, to, to be like, you don't just read because it's a good story. You oftentimes read because you have a, a way of approaching writing. So I'm I'm curious when you first came through that um, that hundred best books of reading experience. Did you come out a different reader than you went in? I think I, I think I did, and I think I I learned some things. Um, you know, because I read I read books that I never would have expected, and I, I learned that I love them. Like Brideside Revisited was on that list, and now I can look at Brideside Revisited and be like that's a queer book like that's a book about two men in love and trying to like mm -hmm. figure it out through like catholicism and and um you know the but the ways that they loved each other that like i was like there's something about this book that's really grabbing me i don't really know what it is i'm obsessed with the sebastian character who's a sort of like feminine very pretty boy and uh I can't tell you why I liked it so much. I mean, now obviously I can tell you exactly why I liked it so much, but at the time I was like, I just want to read this over and over. And so that was one of my first experiences with, with sort of queer, queer literature that I didn't understand was queer literature. Um, and then the other thing was that I sort of understood some things about uh, the United States and about politics in literature that I didn't think I hadn't understood before. I read on that list was Darkness at at noon, which is, you know, an anti-communist book. Mm -hmm. And so it was like an anti-communist book. And, you know, I think George Orwell was on there. So there's a lot of like anti-communist stuff on that list. Uh, uh, Graham Greene was on there. And uh, and I it also kind of inflected uh, an idea of, of like, oh, sometimes books aren't just telling stories. They're, they're, they're speaking to, to these other things. And I think I, it shaped a certain type, shaped me as a certain kind of political writer where I didn't actually want to write that way. I wanted to engage with politics, but I didn't necessarily want to write um, books where it was like an allegory for politics. Some people are consumers of stories and then one day they find that they have a story of their own to share. Some people read their first stories and quickly think, Oh, I would I want to do that. Um, now, how quickly can you can you get a pen in my hand? Where did you fall on that spectrum? The former. I was definitely just a reader. I was like, I like stories, I like reading. I never thought I'd be a writer. And then similarly, I took a writing class. And um, you know, I think if that professor had been like, you're no good at it, I would have never tried it again. It just was like. I was in the class and I and I had a na I'd read so much that I just had a natural um, idea of like sort of narrative arcs and suspense and things like that and and um, I I think I was trying to do like pre med I didn't even know something that was just like very like rigid like this is a life path that you can sort of choose from a box and uh, that professor was like you should be a writer and then. Um, then it was like, you know, really 15 years of struggle to figure out how to do that. So thanks, <laughs> Professor, you know, like, could have been a doctor, you know. Your first novellas were independently published. Mm -hmm. can, can you tell me a bit about how that first book came about and, and you know, what was going on in your life then around it? I, I had gone to the University of Iowa's MFA program and I was going to do, you know, I thought I was going to just be, follow sort of the standard path and two sort of things happened. Um, one is that I wrote a novel that I really liked and was really proud of and it didn't sell. And, um, and that was very, I don't want to say like, troubling for me because I understand why it didn't sell but it was sort of like oh my my tastes and the taste of the world might not be the exact same mm -hmm. and then that precipitated um sort of looking at my life and it, I ended up transitioning you know gender transition and <clears throat> at the same time that I was in transition I talked to some agents 
and I'd said I'd wanted to write about gender. And the response that I got was very like, we think that this trans stuff, especially as you want to write about it, is a little bit icky and there's no market for it. And I'd already, I'd already sort of been like, well, I, I tried to write a, a book that was a mainstream novel, like the one that I had, that didn't sell. And, um, and so if that couldn't, if that mainstream attempt couldn't sell, I don't know how the stuff about trans stuff would sell. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really disillusioned. I went like three years without writing. And then I learned that there was this scene in Brooklyn that was happening. And it was a scene largely with amongst trans women writing for trans women. And I read some of those books that were published by Topside Press, which is a now defunct press, but it was um, just this little press run out of a living room that was publishing books by trans women. Um, and they, I read them and they felt totally different to me than anything I'd ever read because the intended audience was other trans women. So they never stopped to kind of explain themselves. They just assumed that you already knew about this world. And as a result, they were like, a hundred percent story. They never slowed down to sort of do like a one oh one. Here's what it means to be trans. Didn't have to have the half chapter of exposition at the beginning just to sort of totally. set all the, yeah, all the terms. Yeah, and so as a result, it was like, oh, you can tell these stories with trans women that are just like at a flat out run. And you know, later on, I, I learned that like you know, Toni Morrison and, and other minority writers had figured this out that when they thought about you know the audience, their audience being, for instance, Toni Morrison's being black women they didn't have to slow down but we sort of reinvented that wheel and then later on figured out that we were doing what what other people were doing but i read this stuff and i was like oh i actually don't want to write these like sort of hot takes about gender explaining it i just want to write stories and if mm -hmm. i just imagine trans women as my audience i can just go for the darkest weirdest you know most interesting kind of stuff that and and I was excited by that. At the same time that that was happening, um, there was this only only this one press that was was publishing that stuff, and there was a lot of competition to be on it. And so I had this vision that, like, well, instead of fighting over like the two slots a year on Topside, what if all of us in this scene just learned, you know, InDesign, learned Adobe, and and learned how to self publish, which is really all that Topside was doing anyway. Um, we could all have books and we could have a sort of flourishing. And, and I chose the novella because I figured it was like a manageable thing for other people to write and other people to read. I mean, mm -hmm. you can write a novella in three months and it takes an hour to read. So if you're a new writer and you, you, you're not asking for, I need four days of your time to, you know, see about what my vision is. It's like, here's an hour of your time, see what I can do. And, um, and I wrote the, I wrote the masker first or published the massacre first i was writing them simultaneously and you know at first it was like you know it wasn't that it wasn't that big a response but slowly this book that was about you know this this book about really taboo subjects like it was about sissy fetish and and uh, a cop with plastic surgery and uh, a, a masker like someone who wears like a latex mask full body mask mm -hmm. um that that it was a very taboo stuff and and then slowly it started circulating and people were like this is really interesting what it's doing and it avoids because nobody was like a lot of trans writing ended up doing a lot of representation where you sort of represent other trans people but nobody was like i want to be a sissy fetishist so i see myself in this thing and as a result the whole burden of representation that normally trans writers have to deal with i didn't have to deal with because nobody was like that's me. They were like, that's Tori's weird stuff. And so, <laughs> and so as a result, I found myself really free to write whatever I wanted in a number of different ways. One, I didn't have to do representation. And two, I controlled the press. So I could publish whatever I wanted. And the next book, I did this, um, this post-apocalyptic story about trans women who create a, uh, a contagion that makes everybody unable to to produce their own hormones. So everybody has to take hormones the same way that trans people do. Mm -hmm. And as a result, everybody in the world has to choose their own gender and in the same and navigate it the way that trans women do. And maybe you just choose your own, the gender you already have, but it makes the question not just uh, you know, automatic. 
And that book did, did you know, as far as self-published work goes, that book did even better where it was, I got invited to like universities to speak and it'd be like, there'd be these real authors, you know, there, and then there'd be me and they'd be like, what's, you know, who's your press? And I'd be like, well, <laughs> funny, you should ask. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't even bother naming it. That was the novella, Infect Your Friends. Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones, which, yeah. um, you know, now after COVID is, that phrase is, uh, you can see it actually in the wild, disconnected from me. But at the time I, I, I named it because I had seen, I think it was like cop cars in Chicago and I wanted it to be like really dark. It was like protect your, protect your something. And I was like, mm -hmm. infect or so anyway. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the second one was infect your friends and loved ones. One of the tough things about self-publishing is that you have to do so much of the work to find your audience yourself. But in this case, you were publishing into a community that it sounds like was, it was looking for stories about themselves. Did, how did that readership coalesce for you? I mean, you're exactly right. Like that, I think it turned out there were a lot of trans people who were like, we are hungry for stories. And, you know, trans people are uh, a tiny percentage of the population, but with, you know, enough of them, it's a huge, it's actually a pretty big audience and you can actually find them. Like nowadays, like with Twitter and various things, like there's a way in which what I, what, what I think Topside and, and I learned from Topside uh, and, and various other people is that actually I know where to find trans people better than the major publishers. Like if you had given these mm -hmm. novellas to like a big five or I guess now big four publisher back in 2016, they wouldn't have known where trans girls hung out. But I knew where trans girls hung out, especially on the internet. Like I knew I could post on Reddit, I could post on Twitter, and I knew which where where to post and who to tell it to. And, uh, you know, what kind of things would be sticky in that culture in a way that I, you know, I don't think um, even Random House would have known what to do with, with my, with my novel, which was much for a much larger audience where, where Random House knows where they live, they knew exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. But for just this, this audience, it was, I was actually the expert. And as a result, I could, I could get it in the hands of the readers that I was looking for. Were there books and authors that you were reading at this time as you were finding your own voice and as you were figuring out how you wanted to tell the stories that you were telling? Yeah. And it turned out they were my friends, which was something that I'd never had before. I, you know, most of the authors I sort of revered before that, you know, especially at, at like Iowa were these big, you know, these famous names and it felt really cool to basically be like the authors I admire, I could call them up. I could go meet them at a bar. So it was like Imogen Binney, Casey Platt, Sybil Lamb, who all had top side books. Um, Jackie S who has a book coming out on Clash Books now. Um, my friend uh, T Fleischman who had was on Coffee House Press and now is on uh, I think, no, now is on Coffee House Press. I don't remember what, what their first book was, but they were all my good friends, you know, and um, and I admired their books. I admired what they were doing. And it was a little bit, it was competitive in, in a good way. Like um, there's this woman named Morgan Page who's now lives in the UK, but she used to, um, she used to say that we, it was, we had an all, all about Eve situation, you know, where, where it's like a young upstart gunning for the for the for the position that the that the older star had and she positioned herself as, as the star and that I was the young upstart and in fact it was a little bit um it was a little bit like that where I would see what Morgan would do and I'd be like I'm gonna I'm gonna do what Morgan's doing and I'm gonna I'm gonna I see I see a new thing that she hasn't considered and I'm gonna put that out and there was a there was a sense of like urgency around it in a way that I hear about other literary scenes, like, you know, speaking of modernism, like Paris in the twenties or the Harlem mm -hmm. Renaissance, we had that kind of energy where we were trying to outdo each other and that we, there was a collective knowledge that was suddenly 
we could all bring it to bear, you know, it, like 30 of us all thinking at the same time are going to outthink even a genius, you know, thinking off by herself somewhere. So you have these novellas out, your audience is growing, you know how to find them. And so you've, uh, you've built that thing that every, um, that every author hopes for, which is um, you know, a, a community and an audience that are ready for the next book. Some authors stay with self-publishing forever. And um, so what made you decide to go to a traditional publishing house for Detransition Baby? It really was the project. Like I had started that, my original conception for the project was to do a series of five different novellas, each in sort of a different genre, working through trans issues um, in, a, in a different genre. So like Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones, for instance, was, was about um, sort of trans girl sociality and I wanted and working it out in there. So the, the Detransition Baby was supposed to be a soap opera. It was going to be soap opera genre, and but it was going to be shorter. Um, but obviously, soap operas are very long. <laughs> They're not known for brevity, soap operas. Uh, and there was a way in which, um, you know, after it was a couple hundred pages, um, I published a little piece of it as a novella called Glamour Boutique. The, the chapter four, I published it as a novella. But as it got longer and longer, I was like, you know, I think the audience is actually different, you know, than the original audience. Who I'm speaking to is a little bit different. And the actual just size of the project is, is something that I think a big press could do better, you know, could do justice to. Um, there was the, the scene that I was writing in, in 2016, it, it sort of imploded and, but I was still writing. So like by 2018, I was like, I think who, who I'm speaking to is different. I think I'm speaking to cis women. I had this insight that I was speaking a lot to divorce cis women because their trajectory is similar to, I think, a, a transition trajectory. Mm. And once I had that, I was like, number one, it's cost prohibitive for me to self-publish a book that's 340 pages. And number two, I think that Random House knows where these readers live and uh, or not, I didn't know it was Random House at the time, but I think a publisher like them knew where these readers um, live and that they should go, that I should let them find those readers. They may not be able to find you know, trans women, but they could definitely find divorced women. <laughs> exactly. When we had a marketing meeting about it, I was like, they, there was a little bit like, sometimes people trip over themselves and they're like, well, we don't know how to find these queer readers and this and that. And I was like, this is like, this is a woman's a book. It's like, women's fiction like it's a new york novel it's like a girl in the city you know where these readers live like this is what this is your bread and butter just do the thing that you normally do mm -hmm. and once they were like felt like they had permission to just do what they normally do with a trans novel they were like they knew exactly you know who the readers were and it was borne out you know after the after launch the the people who i thought would like it did did seem to like it you know at the core of the story, there are three characters orbiting each other. Can you give me an introduction to Reese and Ames and Katrina? So the story has two timelines, and that's important for understanding um, Ames. So uh, Ames is in the in the present tense timeline is a detransitioned trans woman who is an employee of Katrina, and the ex of Reese, but Reese and Ames dated when, when Ames was Amy. So the past timelines, the, it's Amy, and in the present tense, it's Ames. And then, and the, there's a kind of breakup, um, the, the question of why they broke up is at the heart of that relationship. And then in the present tense, you've got Reese, who, who always wanted to be a mother, who's kind of sassy and, um, a little cynical, sarcastic, um, and she she's jaded, um, and she has a pretty strong voice about about her jadedness. But she really just wants to, to wants to have a family, and she um, so that's and she, and part of the reasons she's disillusioned was that breakup with Amy. 
And then finally there's Katrina, who's Ames's boss. And um, she's, you know, a kind of career woman who's, who's divorced and is a little bit adrift after a divorce. And so the actual plot is that Ames gets Katrina uh, pregnant because they're dating and they're having an affair at work. And then Ames basically says like, what if we, what if we raise this baby with my ex who has always wanted to be a mother? It's hard to like break down this plot. Into oh yeah. Like it really is this tightly woven ball of, you know, these different people and what they need and their, you know, their idea of what family could be and could become and all of the fears of failure that they've ever had in the past. And it's, it's fascinating to watch it unfold. I, both Reese and Ames in their own way are on the other side of transitioning. You know, the big upheaval is over, the first struggles to define yourself, but now you have to figure out how to live the rest of your life. Um, mm -hmm. And how, was that something that you wanted to try and, and portray in this book was, you know, not the early drama, but the rest of your life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I transitioned in, in my late 20s and early 30s. And suddenly I was in my 30s and I was kind of like, now what? Not now, well, how do I actually live? Like, what does it mean? I, I know what a woman is, but like, how do I actually live? And, you know, I looked around and I think, you know, a lot of the older trans women, they didn't really know how to live in the way that this moment calls for because there's new opportunities for, for this generation of trans women the older trans women is really a day-to-day -day survival. But now there's a question um, for, for trans women about, you know, how do we have the things that other women might have? You know, there's a, a question in it called the sex in the city problem, which is, you know, can you have those things that the, that the sex in the city characters embody? Can you have a career or a husband or a baby or make art as opposed to just survive? And, um, so the older trans women were like, we don't know. We never face these mm -hmm. opportunities. And I think also that when I asked the cis women I knew, like, what do you do when you're in your 30s? And a lot of cis women didn't know because I think that every generation kind of has to re, re, redefine that problem. Um, and so that that was that was at the that's at the heart of the story was how does a trans woman live once once the transition story is over, once the drama that everybody thinks about in terms of um, you know, a lot of trans women uh, is over. Um, and I wanted to kind of go right at that, particularly for my, for my generation and, and what it means for my generation of trans women. Reese, in the way that she defines herself through her relationships, through her conception of what it means to be a woman, seems to want to find the edges of gender roles. You know, she's not looking for the safe center and she's not looking for the, you know, the kind of stereotypical median. She wants to be out there on the, on the edge of things a bit. Is, is that one of the things that's propelling her through this book? I think so. But I think it's also that, I mean, I would, I would characterize it as that, actually what she's looking for is in some ways a gender role that's so traditional it looks edgy like the ways right. what she's doing is she's trying to confirm her gender she's trying to basically prove that she is a woman and that she's valid as a woman and so she looks at the things that are like so kind of um that would seem so so banal, like to be a mother or, or to have a boyfriend or, or even banal kind of edgy things like to have an affair or things like that. And she takes that, that middle ground to an extreme, which I realize is a, is a, is a paradox, mm. but, um, but she's not sort of, she's not at all gender fluid, right? She's not kind no. of like playing with gender. She's, she's very much like, I'm a woman. I'm just taking this womanhood to an extreme. Mm. And, um, but it's woman, it's womanhood as we all recognize it. And, um, and I, but I think that that does drive her because what she's not willing, she's so kind of insecure, not insecure, but she's so has 
has spent so long building up this idea of herself as a woman that when she can't have the sort of um, that those roles in the exact way, like it's hard for her as a trans woman to just be a mother the same way that so many other cis women are mothers, that that is, that's her, that's her conflict. That's her struggle. It also gives her a complicated relationship with feminism at the same time. Although I would actually say that she's on the side of a lot of feminist writers who are, so there's like feminism as it's discussed kind of in newspapers as a series of platitudes or a series of ideas about, oh, uh, you know, women should have these rights or that th those rights, but that feminist writers are actually usually quite edgy. So that like the, you know, when, when Reese, for instance, has affairs with, um, men who don't treat her very well and she feels in some ways affirmed in her womanhood with these with these affairs she's echoing feminist writers um you know throughout the 20th century and now she, she's literally quoting sylvia plath with like you know every every woman adores a fascist um these are she's in a long line of of women one of the things that you present so well is that the trans community is not some unified whole, speaking as one voice, uniform in its beliefs. It's like every other community. It's messy and filled with people with their own individual flaws and problems and things that they're working through. And everyone inside a community knows that. How, how did it feel to pull back that curtain a bit to people outside that community and say, here's where we are, here's how we're living? I just took for myself the same rights that any other writer would have, which is largely to shed the burden of representation. You know, if if I basically was like, you know, I don't feel like um, I don't feel like Jonathan Franzen is like, oh no, I'm going to portray uh, St. Louis white people in a, in a negative light. He's just sort of like, I'm going to portray these really specific characters these midwestern mm. characters and um and i'm not gonna feel that sort of guilt or burden and for me i was like well if that's what if if, if someone like franzen gets to be that free why don't i get to be that free like what if i just say that these characters aren't necessarily representing and if a reader decides that they represent that's the reader's choice but it's not necessarily a burden that i have to sort of feel as an author um so and that that i that's hard because obviously you know there are times when when readers are like i can't believe you put this in here i can't believe you showed us this way um and i just have to sort of be like that's that's my res my responsibility as an artist is actually to not necessarily walk around with that burden because i think it creates oftentimes very flat art so much of this book is an inventory of family, people who want families, people who've lost them, either as a consequence of transitioning or of coming out, or people who still need parent figures, but are too hurt or angry to let people fill those roles for them. As you were writing this, were you trying to show the possibilities that could exist uh, within and around family? Yeah, I mean, I think that I was trying to challenge, especially, you know, in some ways I wanted as a provocation to other trans women. So, and I wanted to ask like, what happens, what happens to the nuclear family when you introduce trans women to it? You know, what happens to these sort of ideas of, of American domestic fiction when you introduce trans women to it? And do, how do these structures adapt? How do they change? And then par partly also, it, it, so that's sort of to, to many readers, but also to trans women. Specifically, I wanted to ask like, how are you gonna live now? Like now that like speaking to that question of opportunities for the generations that, that, that I, we talked about earlier, I wanted to say, you know, are you just gonna say I can't have a family in a, in a traditional way, so therefore I don't get family or I'm gonna be only a radical queer and I don't mean only in a, in, a, in a derogatory sense, I'm friends with lots of radical queers and I respect that way of living. Um, but it also, I like the idea that there's a possibility of choice in, in these different ways that we live. And I think that mm -hmm. the work is about um, 
inventing how we live right now. That that the that's that's our that's our responsibility in this generation is to say, what does a family look like for us? And and I didn't. The book ends where it does, not to give away spoilers, but I don't want to prescribe to say that like, oh, a, a triad with two trans women and a cis woman, one trans woman detransitioned is the right way to make a family. The, the, the provocation is more like, can you try to make a family with the people that you have around you? Can you, can you do it? Or are we gonna all just be stuck in either like, there's no family's all bad, we're a bunch of radical queers, or, um, or we have to do a nuclear family thing. Like, how do we compromise? How do we move forward? These are things that I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned with. This is a beautifully written book. And so it deservedly got prize nominations, including the Women's Prize in the UK. And then the backlash started. Can you take me through what happened next? I mean, I think that the backlash is mostly just, I mean, from my opinion, it's, it's bigotry. You know, it's, it's the, the Women's Prize, you know, as I understand it, is, it was created when the Booker was given um, only to men for a while, that there was like, this is our biggest prize in the UK and only men seem to be winning it. So let's create a prize for women. And it was the Orange Prize, which then became the Women's Prize. Mm -hmm. And so if people think that I'm a man, um, suddenly it seems like basically a, a, a man is dressed up as a woman to come and win their literary prize. Um, but that's not how I experience the situation. And if, if, um, and I think that the people who generally feel that way were not people who necessarily loved, uh, literature. I think that there's a contingent of people, especially in the UK, who are very concerned about trans women invading women's spaces and wherever a trans woman happens to show up, they mobilize the, they mobilize mm -hmm. against that trans woman. So whether it be sports, whether it be bathrooms, and in my case, a literary prize. I mean, I didn't, I didn't choose to be in that literary prize. The, the judges chose me. Mm -hmm. And then all of these people came and said like, she's not, well, they didn't use she, but this person is not, uh, eligible and it got quite nasty and, and and they you know kind of tried to destroy me uh or not destroy me they tried to destroy my reputation as a writer um which that's i guess how politics are fought these days so it was a, but it was an unpleasant experience in terms of how, the ways that i was attacked but at the same time this really beautiful thing happened which is that um mostly what was said was recognized by actual readers um, as bigotry and that it was not that the people weren't reading the book they weren't reading the book as as fiction they didn't know how to read it in the complaints they were there they was you know like a woman is it was sort of like in fiction if a bad thing happens to a woman the author is saying a bad thing should happen to a woman well that's not how fiction works and readers recognize this and they began buying the book uh, and there was a real outpouring of of care i think on the part of british readers that i wasn't expecting and the book became a uh, you know a number five on the times bestseller list in the uk and it was really propelled by people who who were curious as readers who did love books and wanted to see what was going on and um and i didn't make the short list but if i had to choose between winning that prize or having the kind of outpouring of love and, and the amount of readers that I ended up getting, I would choose the readers any day of the week. And so in a certain way, although there was um, this period that was not very fun for me being the first trans woman to be nominated for this prize, the outcome in the end was the best that I could possibly ask for, which is that a number of readers read this book in an open-minded way and they liked it and they said so to me, which is, really what you could, the, the most you could dream for as an author. And do you have a sense going through that experience that the, you know, those judges are going to feel you know, affirmed in their choice and comfortable about nominating the next trans woman who writes an amazing book? I hope so. I mean, um, Bernadine Evaristo had a non-binary character in, in, in Girl, Woman, Other. Elizabeth Day 
was, you know, championed, really championed my book. And I, you know, I'd, I would, I think I'd be impugning the judges to say that I wasn't chosen for the shortlist because of, of the backlash. I think that the judges were really brave in, um, in the way that they were attacked personally. A lot of the judges were, were, were personally attacked by, for having selected me. And I really wanna thank them for, for having stood up for me. And I have to trust that I didn't make the shortlist because that wasn't the book that they chose, not because of the backlash. And if that's the case, then I hope that, that the next time uh, that there are judges, those judges will see the previous judges have been brave and, and will themselves be brave. You have said, and you certainly aren't the only person to have said this, that the publishing industry doesn't serve trans women. Now that you've been through the machine and have a book out the other side, would you update that status at all? Yeah, absolutely. I said that, I mean, it's in the back of the novellas, which was, which were, you know, I wrote that blurb, I think when I was, it was 2014, 2015, when I did feel like I was getting really negative reactions. But 2014 is, you know, what Time Magazine called the, the trans tipping point. And by the time I published the book, you know, Transparent was on TV, Pose was on TV, uh, Condé Nast had, you know, a digital publication, Them, that was run by a trans woman. And it seemed actually quite antiquated for me to, to be sort of railing against the publishing industry, especially at a sort of peak of around 2018 through 2019, there were a lot of trans women working in media. At the end of the Trump years in the United States, a lot of those trans women lost their jobs. And so it might be, you know, I think it's an ebb and flow and now is not the best, or maybe last year wasn't the best period. But with the transition baby uh, having been a success, I'm, I'm really happy to see that a number of my friends are getting book deals and they're getting book deals more enthusiastically than, than I got book deals when, I, when, it, when there wasn't a proven success of, uh, of trans fiction. And I'm, you know, that makes me really happy. That's, that's what I was hoping for. And I'm hoping that, um, I know that a lot of the books that, are, that come out will push boundaries in ways that I haven't even begun to dream of and that, they'll do things that I can't do. And I'm, I'm pretty thrilled to be able to read them and see that my friends will have a kind of support that maybe won't make us all have to struggle the ways that we were struggling in 2014, 2013. I mean, it was, it was a hard scene just in terms of financially and, and in terms of scarcity. I, I hope that the new scene and with those book deals, people will be able to write in a little bit more comfort. Having been through that process of traditional publishing yourself, is there advice that you would give to, um, to those trans authors who are going through that process now for the first time or advice that you'd give to the publishers who are trying to find that audience and, and get that book into someone's hands? I think my advice, and, and it goes back to sort of what we were talking about with marketing, is to let the let the publishers do what they do best. I think there's a real a real fear when you run into like a trans author or a trans book that people are like, we don't know what to do with this, right? Or we don't know how to market this, we don't know how to sell it. Well, the th the way is, I think you sell the book the same way that you'd sell it if you were any other minority figure. If you've written a thriller, sell it as a thriller, you know, emphasize that it's a thriller that has trans characters. It's not a trans book that happens to be a thriller. It's a thriller that happens to be written by uh, a trans author. And most of the time, if you give a publisher a good thriller and you tell them sell it the same way that you sell any other thriller, the publisher knows what to do and readers know what to do with a thriller. Um, so generally, I think that um, having been through it, if you don't, if you don't make a huge issue out of the trans part of it, 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 it matters being trans, but it, it shouldn't be the only thing that matters. And if you're able to sort of strike that balance and figure out um, what you're doing in, in other traditions besides just being trans, you can have a lot of success. So earlier you had mentioned that 
detransition baby was was sort of one of a series of novellas that um that like sprung out of its container and <laughs> became too yeah. big to be a novella anymore um is uh is there another one in that uh in that queue that's now starting to uh to get too big for its uh get too big for its pot I'm writing a financial thriller. That's my next book, which is, you know, a queer financial thriller. And I think queers and, and finance and never usually go together, which is partly why I think it's a lot of fun. I'm picturing it sort of as like the big short meets um, meets Great Gatsby. Oh, meets, fantastic. You know, um, basically queer, queer literature where, um, the, and I think that actually in certain ways, talking about money, if you're a queer and who has money and who doesn't have money and why is is really even more of a third rail than something like motherhood and transition. Um, it makes people very uncomfortable to talk about money. But I also think there's this great American tradition of books about money, like Great Gatsby. Um, and I, I want to kind of do a trans spin on that. I cannot wait. Tori, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a pleasure. I've been speaking with Tori Peters. Her new novel is Detransition Baby. It and all of the other books we've talked about here, along with previous episodes of the show, can be found at kobo.com slash conversation, or check the show notes. Make sure to catch every conversation by subscribing wherever you listen and leave us a review because it helps other readers find us. Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Tamlin. Thank you for listening. Thank you.